Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. You could drink in a long list of good principles and biblical ideas. And you could give assent to them and try to go, you know, try to and bring them into action in your life. But that's not the problem. The problem is the very root of your being and how you see things. Because you can be still a self-willed person drinking, as I said, all these good things, and you're still just a self-righteous rebel. 
living in an illusion. Satan will lock people into a, a, a reality that isn't real. The world according to you. And you, you look at things in a, a certain way, you're afraid, it, it may minister fear, it may minister guilt, it may minister pride or self-will, it's going to minister all those things at various times in various ways. I'll tell you one of the worst ones. Sometimes we have our ideas about God. They're not true ideas, but they're our ideas anyway. If there's a God, this is how he's supposed to do stuff. You get what's going on there? I've got my worldview. I know how it really is. And I expect if there's a God that he's going to bow down to my worldview and do stuff the way I think he ought to. And if he doesn't, I'm going to be upset with him. Who is quiet? But is this not the truth? Is this not the truth? Folks, we need to come way down off our high horse. We need a radical, radical, radical translate, trans, uh, yeah, whatever, whatever the word is. We need to be transformed is the word I'm looking for. And you look at somebody like Saul. That's a pretty good example of somebody who was transformed. Because the question is, if we're really in this condition, how does that change? See, if God doesn't, if God does not intervene, it will not change. Why would it change? I, this is real to me. This holodeck of Satan that Satan has constructed in my mind, this illusion that I'm living in, it's real. It feels good or it, it, it sucks me forward. It may not always feel good, but there's always the hope of something else if I just keep pursuing this, this path that I'm on. See, keep following those lusts. Maybe it'll get better. What a horrible treadmill that is. But you think about Saul. Did Saul have a worldview? Oh, my. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was an upholder of the law that God revealed through Moses, as he understood it. He was filled and fired with zeal to fight for this God that he believed in. Man, this, this was real to him. What happened to change that? God, Jesus revealed himself to Paul, to Saul. Revelation. There was a confrontation where he had to come to a realization, I have been living and believing a lie my life has been founded on a lie, and I knew something's got to give. I'm going to do one of two things. I am going to resist this and come up with a rationale as to why I'm right and that's wrong. People do that. They can fight for their right, their rightness. Or they're going to say, who are you, Lord? <laughs> who are you, Lord? That's a, that's a key word. So you recognize this was somebody before he, whom he needed to bow. And so there was a humbling and there was a complete, total reversal of his entire worldview. Suddenly he saw Jesus Christ as Lord. His eyes were beginning to be open to the reality of the gospel and what it meant to die and yet live why Jesus had to die, and boy, he come out of that firing with both barrels. He went on to Damascus, and after he was baptized and, and his eyes were, were opened after that experience, he went right into the synagogues. And he began to preach boldly that Jesus is the Christ. And next thing you know, they said, boy, we've got to do something about this guy. And so they wound, he wound up having to escape down the wall in a basket. But the rest is history. But do you see what's going on there? He had something that was absolutely real to him. You could not debate him out of it. Folks, we cannot debate people out of unbelief. We can pray, but God has to open a heart. God has to confront the will. You remember what uh, Paul talked about right before that passage in 2 Corinthians 4. You, go, you back up into 3 a little bit, and you will see where he's talking about the condition of the people of Israel. And he's, he looks back to the time when Moses came down and his face was glowing 
And the people, whatever it was, he, there was a need for him to literally cover his face so they wouldn't see that glow. It was too much for them. And Paul took a lesson from that. He said, even to this day, there is a veil upon their heart. What does that mean? That means it's hidden. They can't see. They do not possess the ability to see the gospel. You can give it out in absolute clarity and they will just chew their gum and go on. That doesn't make any sense to me. That's foolishness. But I'll tell you, when the heart turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. There is a way out. And that's when God comes calling. What do we do about it? Today, if you hear his voice, do what? Harden not your heart. Don't stand there and resist and argue and say, my reality is right and yours is wrong. We need to recognize the real condition of our own hearts and our own lives and how desperately we need him to change us. And this certainly applies to people coming to Christ. Because as I say, churches are full of people who are absolutely certain they're Christians and they're going to come to the end of the way like they did in Matthew 7. Lord, Lord, haven't I done all these wonderful things? What do you mean? You don't, I'm not yours. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There's a wickedness. There's a, there's a heart rebellion. There's a stubbornness. I'm the God of my own life and I'm going to be religious and I'm going to, I'm going to win acceptance in heaven by me. You still live in Satan's lie. It goes right back to what happened in the beginning. When, when Eve chose the course of self-will, I'm going to fix me, I'm going to chart my course, I cannot trust him. Until that is dealt with in every heart and every life, there is no salvation. And I'll tell you, even when it is, even when there is that surrender, it's easy for us to come to God and then just sort of functionally live as though we're still in charge. That's where we need some changing. And a lot of times we think, okay, my thinking is this way, I grew up in this family, this is how we looked at the world, and I see where I've been wrong in a few areas. And so I need a tune-up. You know, I remember when my dad first came to the church so many years ago, been in ministry for many years, and his testimony was that uh, I came here thinking I needed a tune-up and I needed a major overhaul. And I think before it was over, it was a new engine, but <laughs> I think that's the truth. We do not understand the depth of our need. We think that if I can just add some good principles from God's Word and His wisdom into my way of thinking that I will become better. Am I describing the way it kind of works in, in a lot of our thinking? I need a radical change in the way I think about God, the way I think about myself, the way I think about what matters. Are my possessions mine or are they not? Is my life mine or isn't it? What is the purpose? What is, what, what's important? You think about how Paul was able to come to a place where he said, for to me, to live is Christ. So if I'm still in the world, it's not about me. It's about him living in me and expressing his nature and not my nature, not my purpose. It's not about me. It's about him. So for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, that makes absolutely no sense in Satan's holodeck. But it's reality. This is reality. And I'll tell you, when the heart turns to the Lord, you can begin to see that it's real. How could he, in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, yeah, on, on in 2 Corinthians 4, I believe it is, he, he actually values the difficult things. You know, like when Michael was talking about, it. do all things work together for good or don't they? We have a way many times of affirming what we know we're supposed to say and believe, but the next word is but. 
What's that about? That's like saying, this is what I'm supposed to believe, but it ain't so. Not, you know, we stick that not. God is love, not. Everything God does in my life, or has happened in my life, has happened for a reason, but we're mad at him, we're upset with him. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why is it like this? Why is it not like that? You see what's, happen, what's, what's trying to happen there? I, I am clinging with a death grip to me and my way of thinking, and I, I'm expecting God to bow down to that and, and come in and conform to the way I think it's supposed to be instead of letting go and saying, oh, God. You have peace today? You think maybe just some of this is affecting the status of peace in our hearts? We can come to that place that Paul did where he, he understood I've got to die because my purpose for living is for Christ to express himself through me to other people. And if I don't die, you don't get him. You get me, and that's not going to help you. We need Christ to flow through. So I got to die. So praise God. That's the, one, that's the thing I now value. I don't value me looking good. I value you coming through. And the stuff I got to go through in this world, it's only for a little while. That's a different viewpoint. I'm seeing life and the meaning of this world in an entirely different light. I'm looking at it from the way heaven sees it. That's the problem. Do we think the way God sees things? Can we see through his heart and through his mind? To what degree are we conformed to that? Or are we still grasping our earthly, earthbound ideas? To the extent we are, we're going to sit there and be in bondage and be in, constantly be at war with God in our hearts and there's going to be trouble and strife and bondage that God longs to set us free from. Now you put Romans 12 into this. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. It's your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world. Wake up. Don't buy into Satan's holodeck that he's built for you. This little artificial glasses he's trying to plaster on your head and make you think that's real. Don't be conformed to that. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I need a whole different, I need a, ment I need a worldview transplant. I have got to see with absolute clarity and honesty that what God says is true and it's, he's right and he does love me and he does want the best for me, that my course is only going to be realized, my best is only going to be realized as I come under his hand and surrender and trust him. And then there's that peace, peace that he promises. As I said, how often we tend to add Bible truth to our thinking, thinking that's going to help us instead of replacing our thinking with his truth. And you follow that on through that chapter, and you'll see what that looks like, looks like in our relationships with others, our relationship to God, our relationship to even people in the world who mistreat us. All of those things flow out of a renewed mind that looks at, at the world through different eyes. Oh, God, help us. God, help us to wake up. You know, uh, there's a scripture that really sums up a lot of this in uh, Romans chapter 8. I know I'm covering, covering a lot of ground. I have a habit of doing that, but I just have to, you pray the Lord help me. <laughs> There's a lot in this, isn't there? Verse 5, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds, their minds set on what that nature desires. You see what's going on? It's not just my will. My, my mind is all so tied in with my will. They help one another. They prop one another up. There's an there's a ungodly uh, bond between them. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death. But the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and death. Peace. You see how this ties in? 
life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. You know, last week we talked about the wicked who are like the troubled sea, which what? Cannot rest. Real rest on the inside is totally impossible apart from being in this relationship with God. Just, it ain't going to happen. I don't care what you come up with. There's never going to be any inward rest. But even for us, we're not going to enjoy it like God wants us to. You know, the more we cling to the old life and the old ways and the old ways of thinking. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful desire, nature rather, cannot please God. You are not, however, are not controlled. All right. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. I'll tell you, what God has for us is beyond imagining. Do you not believe that God desires that you, everyone right here today, that we have an inward rest and peace in our hearts? Yeah. Why would he tell us, for example, the familiar scripture, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer, and supplication of mixing translations, let your request be made known unto God. And what? The peace of God that passes understanding. It's a whole lot. You can't explain it. How many of you have been in situations where, you know, it looked like the world was going to hell in a handbasket. You had all kinds of troubles, but there's this unexplainable peace on the inside. Yeah. That's real. I tell you, that can, out, that can outweigh all the stuff that Satan tries to put in there. If we have his peace, because we're trusting in him, we, we know what's really, what's really true. We're just not buying into this fake holodeck stuff. We know what's really true. And then it goes on to say, the peace of God will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. What an awesome thing. You know, and you bring into it a couple of other scriptures that we know well, that one in uh, 2 Peter, chapter, the beginning of one, grace and peace through the knowledge of God. I'm just summarizing the words. Yeah, it's multiplied through the knowledge of God. And he talks about the great and precious promises. The more we are able to drink in the truth about how it really is, the more we're going to experience grace, which is the help I need, and peace to know that I'm at I'm at rest in his care, in his arms. He, he knows everything about me, and I can trust him. You want to read another passage? Look at Ephesians 4, 17 to 24, because we, we need to be renewed. I'm not going to try to go through it now. Time is short, but being renewed in the attitude of our minds is a really key phrase in that. Don't live like the heathen live. Live out the new life that God has begotten in you. There's a new life he's created in you. Live that one out. Be renewed in the attitude, the attitude of my mind. My world, if my worldview comes into line with him, man, I'm going to see things differently. I'm going to act differently. Everything's going to be changed. If I'm just trying to be religious, that's phony. God doesn't want that. He wants people who will just come to him as they are and say, oh, God, I need you to fix me. I can't fix myself. But how about another scripture that we've heard many times, Psalm 119, 165, great peace have they who love your law and nothing can make them stumble. How many want to be in that place? Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Nothing can trip you up. <laughs> if there's that love for God and his, his word and his truth and our will is submitted to him and we realize my highest interest is served by just glorifying him and serving him. He's going to lift me up to a place of, of blessing, honor, meaning, usefulness, everything you could think of that we were made for. Everything that I can never, I can, I can chase this illusion that Satan is building in front of my mind is all I want to. It'll never do the job. And it'll lead, it'll lead to death and of disillusionment in the end. Listen to what the Lord says in closing. In Isaiah 48, 17 to 18, a lot of times the Lord was, was talking to the Israelites. There were promises of what was to come, but there was a 
the finger of God's light being shined on why they were in the spiritual condition they were in. And he says, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river, your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Do you sense his heart? Do you sense his heart toward you this morning? That he longs for every and me, the long, he longs for every one of us to occupy that place of peace and rest where our whole way of thinking about ourselves, the world, everybody else is just totally different at odds with, you know, escaping Satan's holodeck. Turn it off. See, I need my mind to be transformed. I need you to change, not just my, this little idea, this little, you know, kind of rearrange my thinking a little bit so I'm more functional. It's not about that. It's not about getting, on, getting along in this world. It's about being transformed for God's eternal purpose. Rescued out of an illusion, a lie. And, oh, and, and we can, he, he can enable us to see the truth as it really is. I want to see the unvarnished truth, even when it shows me what I am, especially when it shows me what I am, because he does it in a way that lifts me out and gives me hope and says, I know what you are. I went into this salvation business knowing the worst thing about you, and I loved you, and I, could, I have the answer. But you're going to have to bring all of that into the light. Face it. Bring it to me. Humble yourself, and I will lift you up, and I'll give you a new heart and a new life and a new mind. And the more our minds can be come into, con come into alignment with his word, you, you understand why Paul saw his ministry as casting down reasonings? Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You see how all this ties together? What's your worldview today? Are you at the center of it or is Christ at the center? That's going to answer a whole lot the question about whether you really are enjoying the peace that God has provided for every one of us in Jesus Christ. I want that, don't you? Yes. Praise God. This has been the Midnight Cry broadcast. If you would like a DVD or a CD of today's message in its entirety, please request it by program number. DVDs are $10 and CDs are $5. And for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your request to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. We invite you to join us again next week at this same time, and may God richly bless you until then.